Uh, kdyby tady byl někdo, kdo má skutečně s angličtinou problém, uh, tak tady máme tuším desetkrát vytištěny ty prezentace, které budou promítány uh, s, ang- s českým překladem. Jo? Takže uh, Máme to pouze v tomto omezeném počtu, vycházíme z toho, co jste tam vyplnili, předpokládáme, že ten minimálně ten písemný projev na těch prezentacích, že, že pro vás bude stravitelný, ale jak říkám, desetkrát, to znamená bezmála polovina nebo třetina z vás má možnost si to zde vzít, takže skutečně nestýďte se případně se obsloužit. Můžeme to udělat takže pokud teď zvednete ruku vůbec opravdu za to nestýďte, tak já to roznesu, jestli někdo chce mít k dispozici. A nebo si úzko, jestli bych se roznesla, já budu, já budu to mluvit. ještě jednou zvednou ruce teda, kdo má zájem? Tady pan, pan inženýr, tamhle vzadu pán. A já teda teď, jak jsem avizoval, tak ten formát bude v angličtině, takže já teď plynule, plynule skočím, nechci říct do angličtiny, protože to bude moje angličtina, ale potom uslyšíte určitě mnohem lepší angličtinu. Uh, well, uh, welcome to our workshop. Uh, we are very pleased uh, we have you here, and uh, let me introduce our pressure uh, visit guest uh, from University of Vermont, Mr. Professor William S. Keaton, uh, who is the main person of this workshop, and uh, let me introduce uh, him uh, shortly. Uh, William Keaton is a professor of forest ecology and forestry at the University of Vermont. Rubenstein School uh, of Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, at the uh, University of Vermont, he directs uh, the Carbon Dynamics Laboratory and uh, is a fellow in the Gantt Institute for Environment. He currently chairs the Euphro Working Group on Old Growth Forests and Reserves and serves uh, on the advisory board for science uh, for the Carpathians. Uh, his research focuses uh, on forest dynamics old growth forests, riparian ecology, uh, forest carbon and natural disturbance based silviculture. Uh, he holds a BS in natural resources uh, from Cornell University, a master's in conservation biology and policy from Yale University and a PhD in forest ecology uh, from the University of Washington. Uh, já si ještě dovolím to, toto uh, kratičce v češtině. Pan profesor je profesorem lesní, lesní ekologie a lesnictví na Univerzitě ve Vermontu, to je jeho hlavní pracoviště Rubenstein School of Environment, Rubensteinova škola životního prostředí a přírodních zdrojů. Studuje především dynamiku uhlíků, kde vede na toto téma laboratoř na svém pracovišti a společnost Gund Institutu pro životní prostředí. V současnosti též předseda pracovní skupině UFRO pro pralesy a rezervace, je též členem skupiny Věda pro Karpaty a jeho výzkum cílí především na, dynamiku, na lesní dynamiku, pralesy, přirozené lesy, nivní ekologii, uhlík v lese a lesnictví založené na přírodních disturbancích, na přirozených disturbancích, což bude primárním tématem tohoto workshopu. Well, I uh, now let me to give word uh, to our guest, uh, Professor William S. Keaton. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. It's really a, a pleasure to be back at your university. This is my, my third time here. I was here many years ago. Um, it's great to be back, and it's great to see all of you this morning. Before I get going, I, I'd like to thank uh, Peter and Lucy and Andre and Michael and Daniel in the back for all the help that you've given me over the last couple of days. And um, I'm really looking forward to the next few days in Slovakia with some of these uh, people uh, hiking and seeing some of the, the forests there. Um, before I get going, I'd just like to say that, um, you know, in the U.S., we're very casual, we're very informal in our style, especially in workshops like this, and we prefer a much more dynamic, interactive, engaged kind of style. I'm a pretty casual guy, so I'd like to encourage you to just ask questions at any time. Uh, just feel free to interrupt, raise your hand, and we can just have conversation back and forth and just see how it goes. 
So that would be my preferred style this morning. Um, the, the purpose of the workshop uh, is to, to think a little bit about different perspectives on nature-based forest management that have developed in North America as compared to Europe, and then just compare and share some of our experiences. Um, my own impression is that researchers and forest practitioners like yourselves have been pursuing these lines of research in parallel for at least 20 years now, but so far we haven't had very many syntheses or opportunities to put all of this together and maybe formulate a broader, more global um, understanding of these nature-based approaches. So that's our objective this morning, just to compare, to compare notes, compare um, lessons that we've learned, and then hopefully through the small group discussions and then the questions that we've just distributed, at the very end we'll have an opportunity to synthesize some of the recommendations that everyone in this room might make. And then um, uh, the, the group here at this university can put those together into some kind of publication or maybe make those available on the web for others to see. So that's our objective for this morning. And we're going to begin um, with a, a broad overview of this topic that I'm going to give for the next hour or so. Um, and, and has Peter already gone through the agenda? In, in check, is that what you're doing before the agenda? Okay, so you know the, the format for the rest of the day. So um, I'll just I'll just launch into it then. Um, so this is a, a topic that I've worked in, gosh, since the early 1990s. I, I got my start right out of uh, my master's program working in the Pacific Northwest, to the northwest corner of the United States. And I don't know if you're familiar with our history there, but in the, the early and mid 90s, forest management became incredibly controversial. The, our old growth forests were severely threatened by a century of clear-cut logging. We had many endangered species, more than a thousand species associated with these old forests. And there was almost a desperate attempt to come up with alternative ways of managing forests. You're seeing pictures of some of those approaches here as, as an effort to really complement the protected area systems that were established at that time. So that's where I, I cut my teeth, as we say in, in American English. I got my first exposure to these ideas. And then I, I moved to the eastern United States to take a job at the faculty of the University of Vermont. And I've pursued this research ever since, but, but more in the context of eastern deciduous forest forests in North America. And then for the last 15 years or so, maybe almost 20, I've I've had the, the good fortune of collaborating with many uh, European scientists in Central and Eastern Europe, and, and, and I've developed some appreciation of, of what you're doing here, although I have much more to learn. So um, that's, a, that's my own personal history a little bit, but um, the, the, the way I'd like to set up this topic is by thinking about how silviculture, sustainable forest management, complements other conservation strategies, in particular protected areas. And you know there's some tension in the conservation field. Should we be emphasizing protected areas or should we be emphasizing sustainable forestry? And my view has always been that these are not mutually exclusive. These are complementary approaches and we need both. They need to go hand in hand. But let's think for a minute about protected areas and, and, and how much we can rely on those so for example, if we look at, I know, I apologize, in the back of the room, it's probably difficult to see these slides, but I, hopefully you can get the general idea. If we look at this, the status, the protection status of the world's forests, and you see kind of major forest types here in these bars, and then the shading are the, the IUCN categories, the, the degree of protection, what you see is that there's tremendous unevenness. In, in how well we've protected forests globally. Some forests are better protected than others. Some have more strict protection. Others are in IUCN categories five and six, so multiple use, actively managed. So it's a range of protection, and this is important as a foundation for conservation, but we can't rely on, on protected areas entirely. By some estimates, 80% or more of the world's biodiversity would be left uh, insufficiently protected were we to rely on protected areas alone. 
So they're important, but they won't give us everything we need. And if we look at some of the, the intensively managed landscapes of the world, and of course you can find these in Central America, South America, um, Africa, many, uh, East Asia, many landscapes um, like this in my own country, in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington State. This is the Strait of Juan de Fuca here. You see British Columbia and Canada to the north. Uh, a typical Western landscape in North America in that we have the managed landscape that has been intensively managed through this practice of dispersed, um, dispersed patch clear cutting, dispersed clear cutting, essentially even aged silviculture practiced on short rotation, so very intensive management. And then we have our protected areas like Olympic National Park. And oftentimes there are these very, very rigid boundaries between those like you're seeing here. And so yes, the protected areas like Olympic National Park are incredible and those give us huge value, but they aren't going to conserve biodiversity across that larger landscape. And moreover, we need other approaches out here to ensure connectivity, to ensure uh, the functioning of watersheds, to provide carbon storage, pollination services, all the other ecosystem services that we need at the landscape scale. So this was the scenario then in the Pacific Northwest that then gave rise to a concept that we call matrix management. Let me go back one slide. To us, when I use that term matrix, it basically means the landscape. So the larger landscape, the larger matrix that these protected areas are embedded inside of. And the lesson for us in North America is we need to pay more attention to that broader landscape, to the matrix, because again, it complements, it supports those protected areas. It supports population of species, their demography, their interaction among subpopulations, the ability of species to disperse across broader landscapes, so it regulates their movement, their, their, um, their uh, population ecology, the broader landscape buffers those uh, protected areas, it maintains the integrity of aquatic ecosystems, watersheds, streams, rivers, floodplains, all, all those other things that protected areas generally don't do a very good job of. Um, and of course this is where the, the majority of our opportunities for extractive uses will come from, and so we need to make sure that we do the management there well. Okay, so this was the idea then, sort of behind matrix management, and, and then later a concept that we call disturbance-based forestry. So um, uh, the idea is if, we, uh, if we're looking for a silvicultural approach that will provide all of these functions on the managed landscape, could we do that by emulating natural disturbances in the way natural disturbances interact with forest dynamics? Succession, stand dynamics, forest development, and the underlying assumption, which is essentially a working hypothesis, is that the species have co-evolved with disturbance regimes and therefore they should be adapted to the range of conditions that natural disturbance regimes would create on a landscape. So could we model our silviculture on those processes a little bit more closely and, and then provide the, the full range of habitat conditions that species need, the full range of biodiversity, the full range of seral stages and successional stages and habitat conditions. So this is the underlying assumption then. And then if we sort of put all of this together, this was my attempt a few years ago to make sense of this, and we think of forest management as, not, again, not being a strict dichotomy. You don't have to protect or intensively manage. Forest management is a range of opportunities. It's a spectrum ranging from high intensity industrial forest management on one end to, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, over here, uh, to strict protection at the other end. And it's this whole middle ground of sustainable forestry practices that we're really interested in and where these disturbance-based approaches might be useful. Okay, so they complement protected areas, but they don't replace them. That's a key, a key concept. Okay, so 
that's just a little background on, on sort of the origin of disturbance-based forestry in North America. Um, and it's just been very interesting in the last 30 years, I suppose you could say, to, to watch these ideas spread around the world and we see examples of disturbance-based management uh, tested in many places, such as the various different close to nature uh, silviculture approaches here in Central Europe, although I will be really interested to hear from you today whether you think this represents disturbance-based forestry or whether you think of it as being something different or maybe there's an opportunity to bring these together. I'm not sure yet. I, I'll be interested in, in your views. <clears throat> um, Eastern North America, we have various different gap uh, uh, and irregular shelterwood systems we're experimenting with, and of course in uh, southwestern Australia and, and other places you see various different multi-aged uh, silvicultural systems uh, uh, used there. So we've seen this sort of global interest develop around this topic, but of course the silviculture always adapted to the local forest types and the local disturbance regimes. That's, that's a key concept. And then again, if we try to summarize all of this, and this is imperfect, but this is just a beginning, we try to summarize or distill maybe some key principles that all of these systems are trying, perhaps we can imagine it as one of these triad models or a, a three-legged stool. So we need each leg of the, of the stool for, for it to stand. And we can, we can say, okay, maybe there's three key principles we should think about. The first is incorporating biological legacies into our harvest regimes. So legacy structure, structural retention of live and dead trees, standing and down, the idea of retention, mimicking the biological legacies that natural disturbances leave. We might think about what we can do with intermediate treatments, so not just regeneration harvests, but also various different types of thinnings um, in the stem exclusion stage of forest development and in, in young to medium age forests. Are there, are there ways we can emulate natural, nat I'm sorry, natural disturbance processes in those forests as well? And then finally, is there a role for extended rotations longer recovery periods to yield some of those late successional structurally complex conditions that conventional silviculture has tended to underemphasize. So these are the three principles then of disturbance-based forestry, at least according to this model, and I thought this morning I would go through each of those providing some examples along the way. So I'll start with legacy retention and, and um, I'll tell you a little bit of a story about this where that idea came from in North America at least. And uh, I think we can trace it all the way back to this place right here, Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Um, this is one of the many volcanoes in, in that part of the country. It's part of the Pacific Rim of Fire with all the seismic activity. And uh, of course it erupted in 1981. It was a massive pyroclastic eruption uh, 1,000 feet, that's about 300 meters of the, of the top of the mountain, exploded, blew off, but the, the eruption moved horizontally across the landscape, again as a pyroclastic flow, a superheated cloud of ash and debris moving at um, supersonic speeds, and uh, within minutes it, it leveled uh, an enormous land landscape of several hundred thousand hectares in size. And much of the blast zone immediately afterwards looked like this. And people used words like devastation and ecological disaster to describe this. But then pretty quickly, ecologists got out into the blast zone and they saw signs of life reemerging everywhere from the soil underground. They saw uh, plants and animals that had been sheltered by topography in various ways. And of course, they saw this incredible carryover or legacy. Um, to use that word legacy or heritage maybe is another way of saying it, of organic matter that was left on site, often dead, sometimes alive. And it was both standing and down. And very quickly ecologists got in there and they established permanent plots like this one 
And we've had a record ever since of natural ecosystem recovery, how this happens and how it's facilitated by these biological legacies. This is a picture just 15 years after the eruption and you see the Douglas fir coming up very, very efficiently through that legacy structure. And you know, we learned a lot of things here. One of the things we learned is that our, a lot of our previous understanding uh, of ecosystem recovery was wrong. It was just incorrect. Like foresters in North America used to think that the trees would not be able to come up through all this material. And therefore, we would always salvage log, we would always remove this structure. In the old days, we used to broadcast burn. Also, we would burn up the material, which created a lot more damage than, than it did good. We had many other misunderstandings as well. Like, for instance, we used to think that large woody debris in streams was bad for fish. It turns out that in North America, that's completely wrong. In fact, the fish depend on woody debris, and they have no problem moving uh, over it and, and um, jumping over debris dams. And, and, and so now we're putting wood back into the streams for, for our trout, for our salmon, for other species. So, you know, we've learned some things, which is that some of our older ways of, of managing were maybe incorrect or misguided. So, this is where in North America, at least, that concept of biological legacies came from. And, and then over time, of course, we've learned a lot about the ecology of biological legacies in many different places, under many different types of disturbances. This is my only picture of a fire-related um, uh, topic. Moreau asked me not to talk about fire. He said, talk about wind and, and other kinds of disturbances because you're in Europe. But uh, one, one quick uh, uh, you know, reference to fire. So one of the things we've learned is that natural disturbance effects are highly complex. They're highly spatially variable and heterogeneous. So we need to be careful about generalizing. So for example, if we look at this burn severity map, um, this is from one of our big fires in, in the state of Oregon. I understand that Dan Donato, one of my former students, was here a number of years ago. Some of you know him. This is the, the famous burn area where he worked in. And you're looking at this burn severity map. Red are the areas that burned most intensively. Green was basically skipped over by the fire. Yellow is sort of a moderate severity burn. We see mixed effects. So we see some areas where the legacy structure might be primarily dead trees, other where there's a you know, high carryover of live, living legacy structure, and everything in between. So spatial variability is a key concept. Um, other things that we've learned. Um, the more we look for legacies, the more we find them. So maybe the science, at least in North America, began in the Pacific Northwest, but then it percolated across the continent and now, and we've been looking for legacies in lots of different ecosystems now, and we find them. So, for instance, this is my old research site in the Pacific Northwest. There's Dan right there, Dan Donato. And you're seeing um, legacy trees. This is a 500-year-old tree that's incorporated into a much younger 150-year-old forest that regenerated around it after a fire. 150 years ago, so this is the classic western situation, but then in the eastern U.S. where I work now, I find legacy trees as well. So this is an old growth yellow birch, Betula elegeniensis, embedded in a much younger forest that regenerated after a hurricane, after a windstorm. So we see this everywhere we look now, this kind of carryover of legacy trees, living and dead, standing and down, and we now know that where we have legacy structure like this incorporated into secondary forest development, this structure performs a number of functions. Um, so one very obvious function is the lifeboating effect, like Noah's Ark. You know, the lifeboating organisms through this period of uh, post-disturbance and then through secondary succession literally providing the structure that, those, some, that some species need that would otherwise be absent if we did not have these legacies. So that's important. Of course, there are other functions too, like carbon and soil stabilization and preservation of the below ground community. If you have 
um, symbiotic uh, interactions or relationships with mycorrhizal fungi, for example. So there are a whole range of functions that these legacies can provide. And that's why then, now moving from the ecology to the silviculture, we now have silvicultural systems that are designed to emulate this dynamic, to provide biological legacies in our managed forest ecosystems. And again, I need to sort of, I need to contextualize this by reminding you that what we were looking for here was alternatives to clear cutting and to very intensive forest management, which created many problems for us uh, in the past. So we were looking for alternatives to those. And um, we came up with, with this system here, which is called the Variable Retention Harvest System. Now, let me explain this for a minute because it's uh, a little complicated and it might be different from, from what you've seen before. If you think about classic silviculture, classic textbook silviculture that we all learn in college, it's really a series of dichotomies. It's a series of splits, right? You have even, either regeneration harvests or you have intermediate treatments. And then within regeneration harvests, harvests you have even age management, you have uneven age management. Then you have single tree selection, group selection. It's a series of dichotomous splits on a tree. That's textbook silviculture. This system rejects that idea. In fact, one of our most famous silviculturalists in the United States, Robert Seymour, and he's literally written the book, the textbook on silviculture, great book, but he said, it's time to take your silviculture textbook and throw it out the window and start all over again with something different. A controversial, provocative statement, of course. I still love my silviculture textbook and I would never throw it out the window. But uh, the idea is maybe there are completely different ways of thinking of this. So rather than a dichotomy, a series of dichotomous splits, we envision silviculture as being a continuous spectrum of opportunities defined by the level of retention at each harvest. And if we think about retention then, we see things like even-aged and uneven-aged or multi-cohort silviculture overlapping. These different approaches kind of grade into one another. And of course, um, the degree of retention would also then affect things like rotation periods and entry cycles and all the th other things that we need to pay attention to. And then finally, in the variable retention system, we think about both regenerating a new cohort of trees at the same time that we're increasing the growth increment on the trees that we leave behind, that we retain. Whereas in classic silviculture, that's, that's a no-no, right? Classic silviculture, either you regenerate new trees or you thin to increase growth increment, but you don't do the same thing at, at, at once. Well, that's not how Mother Nature does it. Mother Nature does both of those things at the same time. She regenerates new trees while um, thinning the trees that she leaves behind. So in this, in this approach, we can uh, leave room for that idea as well. I'm gonna take my coat a little hot in here. Okay, so um, that's the idea behind vari variable retention harvesting. Um, and now we're trying this, we're testing it in many different places and in many different applications on public lands, on private lands, um, different scenarios. So for example, one of the largest experiments that we have is this one. It's called the Demonstration of Ecosystem Management Options. It's a fully replicated, randomized block experiment. We have these, these blocks and at each block we have these six different treatments. Of course, there's a control. There's different levels of retention, 15%, 40%, 70%, and two different spatial patterns, dispersed retention and, and aggregated retention. And then that block is replicated 20 times from the border with British Columbia down through Northern California. So we have, and this has been going on for 25 years now or so, so we have some pretty good long-term data from that study. At the same time, we see these ideas now employed by a number of major timber companies. For example, Warehouser Timber Company, one of the largest companies in North America. Um, they now use retention harvesting as standard practice. Again, replacing the old um, clear cutting or very uh, high intensity even age management. 
And Weyerhaeuser is experimenting with retention in many different ways. You're seeing examples here in some of their British Columbia lands with lower levels of retention. We'll, we'll grow Douglas fir the fastest. That's what we used to think. Now as we start retaining structure, you know, there will be more shade and theoretically that could reduce the productivity of Douglas fir. Reasonable question. So what we need to know then is how productivity will respond. And this is the example from that experiment of the growth increment under the different levels of retention. And um, let's see here, we have dispersed versus aggregated. So the different patterns of retention. And to summarize a very long story, what we're learning is that um, we can have retention at a certain level, 15 to 30% and still have very high productivity in these forests, very reasonable productivity. So there's an example of taking these ideas and adapting them to the specific forest type that you're working in. Regeneration, growth increment, these things will always be important, and, but you can adapt your level of retention um, to your local conditions, as we've done here through this kind of research. Okay, so that was a very long explanation of biological legacies. I, I should speed this up here. I'm, I'm way behind in my, my timing. Let's move on to the, the next leg of the stool. So if we think about intermediate treatments. So again, this is the idea of maybe modifying the way we thin forests. Um, Mother Nature, through natural disturbances, never uniformly thins a stand, or rarely. Rarely would you have absolutely uniform mortality from insects or root rots or wind or something else. Much more often, natural disturbance effects and interactions are spatially variable. Um, this is true also of density-dependent mortality, so inter-stem competition, um, uh, self-thinning, the process of stem exclusion. Um, very rarely is that a purely uniform spatial process. So if we're thinking about emulating those natural dynamics, we could maybe experiment with variable density things or non-spatially uniform intermediate treatments. So that's the thinking behind what we now call variable density thinning. Um, again, as an alternative to, to the more conventional uniform spacing that we might have used in the past. Um, so in this guide here, we see an example, and um, these scientists are envisioning this as a grid that a forester could use with grid cells and thinking about thinning some, grid, some cells more intensively, other cells less intensively, and then maybe skipping some cells entirely. Now this kind of grid with cells works great in a plantation you know, a sort of a, a, with a monospecific stand of, of trees um, on, on level terrain, it works great. In forests where I work in eastern North America, this would never work because our forests are so diverse and they're so spatially heterogeneous and our, our terrain is so complex. Um, we would need to adapt this on the ground one patch at a time. But the general idea, the general theory is still very interesting. Variable density thinning. Okay, so now I, I want to give you a, a practical example of this, an example of this in, in use operationally. And, and I, need, I need to tell you another story about um, sort of how this was adapt, adopted. Why are people interested in using variable density thinning? So uh, the example I'll use is, is this silvicultural guide right here that's called Silviculture with Birds in Mind. And uh, that, that might strike you as, as odd or interesting. Why are they not talking about timber or, you know, or, or volume production or, or these more classic objectives? And I'll tell you why. A few years ago, we had a national survey of private forest land owners. And the, the social scientists asked the, the owners, what do you care about from your forest? What do you value? And everyone was expecting them to say timber, economic revenue. They were very surprised when the number one objective was birds, at least on small private ownerships. What people enjoy the most from their land is birds. They want to be able to see birds. 
Timber was five or six down the list. Number two was aesthetics and uh, sort of wilderness experience, the experience of being in the forest, those kinds of things. So some very surprising results. So foresters where I live in, in the northeastern U.S. thought about this and we thought, aha, if we can come up with disturbance-based silvicultural approaches that manage for bird habitat, boom, we're going to get landowners to, to use our ideas. You know, we'll gain a lot of acceptance among the public for these concepts. Like, that's something that people can understand if you explain it to them in terms of bird habitat. So we came up with this, this approach. And of course, because we have 200 or more species of migratory songbirds, we can't come up with a different silvicultural system for each one. Instead, we, 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 we chose 12 species that are indicators of different functional guilds of bird species. They live in different habitat types, different successional stages. And then we developed a silvicultural system for each of these 12 species. Again, indicators of the broader avian biodiversity. And the way this works is you start with the forest type that you're working in, because again, everything has to be adapted to the particular forest type, particular disturbance regimes, etc. OK, so we have some general forest types where I live, and we sort of multiply that by or overlay that against the stand condition. Is it a young forest, an old forest, structurally simple forest, or structurally complex forest? What is your existing condition? And then given that, what kind of bird species are you interested in managing for? And so then based on these three things, we come up with the silvicultural options. Now again, Disturbance-based forestry is never just one option. It's never a one-size-fits-all thing. We try to sell this to people as um, like having different tools in your toolbox. You always have options, flexibility, different things that you can do. So here we're talking about variable density thinning. Do you remember this? We're talking about intermediate treatments. And we're seeing, okay, just for that one example I gave you before, we have three options you could do variable retention or variable density thinning, and this guy tells you how to do it. You could do a mixed thinning regime, uniform density, um, uh, variable density, different kinds of thinnings. You could use something called crop tree release, which is another type of thinning that we use in the United States. It's, uh, I don't know if you have parallels here in Central Europe, but the, but the point here is that you have several different disturbance-based intermediate treatments that you might consider using. Okay, so, yes? Ask, um, so you, there was this impressive survey done and showed that a large number of forest owners are more interested in bird habitat. Right. Uh, does that scale to like the, like the area as well? I mean, I'm sort of imagining, okay, there's a lot of individuals that own small patches of yeah. forest and they're interested in having managers come in and apply these techniques, but what about more industrial yeah, Scale. great question. So, and I'm glad you asked me that. So the survey was just of private, non-industrial forest owners, uh -huh. so not big timber companies. But keep in mind that in the eastern United States, for example, what is the number? 80% of our landscape is privately owned. 80% by small private woodlot owners. So that's the majority of the landscape that would be interested in this. Um, John, you're from Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the situation is very different up there, of course, where the majority of your forests are, are government-owned um, and the private lands are, are in the minority, but still relevant there. Um, so you don't see this as much on industrial timberlands, but it's still relevant in some cases. It's large. Yeah. Yeah. So that's the answer to your question. Okay, um, moving on, the third leg of this disturbance-based stool we need to think about these recovery periods also. So here we get into ideas of extended rotations, um, which in my understanding, you have a, a, a lot of familiarity with here in, in Europe, a lot of experience with this. And the, some of the countries I've worked with in, in Central Europe, they're already using what we would consider to be extended rotations. So maybe this is nothing new to you, but for us, it's, it's a little bit new. Because in the past, for example, we would set rotation periods, especially in even-aged silviculture, but also on an individual tree basis if you're talking about selection systems. We would base that on the classic culmination of mean annual increment. 
right, where the PA, PAI line crosses the MAI line. So culmination of mean annual increment, this is where we would set the optimal rotation period to maximize the yield of fiber, and boom, you have your, you have your rotation period. With extended rotations, what we're talking about is extending the rotation period past the optimal rotation for, for timber, or past the optimal rotation for fiber, with the objective of providing other ecosystem services in our managed forests. So still providing timber, but also integrating other objectives, such as, oh, I don't have the slide yet, such as carbon and a very high degree of hydrologic regulation, habitat for late successional species, structurally complex stand conditions, the other things that develop late in forest development that you would otherwise exclude from the landscape if everything was managed based on optimal rotation period. So that's the concept of extended rotations. And of course, we can find some very interesting examples of this. One of my favorite is in Belgium at the, the Merdal Forest. Have any of you visited this forest? No? It's well worth a trip next time you find yourself in, in Brussels or, or Louvain. So this is a very, very old forest. There actually are some kind of historical evidence going all the way back to the Roman periods. Apparently when Julius Caesar was invading Gaul, he made reference to this forest that was actually in existence at that time, believe it or not. Um, but uh, for the last 400 or 500 years, it's been managed continuously, as I understand it, by, by monks, by a, a local monastery. So a long history of, of management there, and they've been managing it using extremely long rotation periods on the order of two or three hundred years for beech and also for English oak. Um, but interestingly, they do this on an individual tree basis. So each tree is marked and, and grown for 300 years or more before it's harvested. Absolutely inc incredible, fascinating system that they've been using now for, again, almost 300, 400 years. And it works marvelously. Other interesting things they do, they leave large woody debris on the ground. They even leave some large dead trees, like this dead oak, to, uh, to enrich this forest structurally. It's a very interesting example of extended rotations. So there are a number of advantages of extended rotations um, that we could think about, some of which I've mentioned before. I think I'll move through this more, more quickly in the interest of time. But then, of course, there are also some disadvantages and some potential risks and, and things that we need to think about. Um, if we think about just conventional timber management objectives, of course, there are trade-offs here. Let me go back to this slide. Um, there are trade-offs. So as we extend our rotation period, we might produce higher dimension trees. So we might produce more of, let's say, high dimension lumber or, or wood products. Um, and uh, those are increasingly of interest for, um, for mass timber structures, large timber frame structures that people are interested in building in some parts of the world. Um, so there's a benefit there, but that often comes at the cost of volume production. Your overall volume, merchantable volume, is probably going to be lower because you, you have more defect. You have more heart rot, you have more mortality, you have defects. So the higher quality and value for some stems could be offset by the lower value on other stems. So this is always an economic trade-off that managers are considering. So that's one important point. And then, of course, another is the interaction with disturbance. Now, this can be controversial depending on you, where you are in the world, and I'll be curious what your opinions are on this question. But, for example, uh, Rupert Seidel and his colleagues published this very important paper in 2014 in uh, Nature Climate Change. Very important paper um, uh, and, and uh, very interesting um, using some modeling as well as historic data they were able to show that um, uh, 
as, as climate changes over the next several decades, the potential for uh, some disturbances may increase as well. There may be an increase in wind disturbance in Europe, the, the uh, bark beetle risks associated with drought and other um, phenomena may increase. And so you have this increasing tendency towards disturbance. And at the same time, extended rotations may increase some of those risks. Although I know that your group works on this extensively, so I'll be very interested in your opinion on this topic. But in this paper, at least, they were, they were suggesting that longer rotations with climate change may yield higher disturbance risks. So that's something to think about, and it me means that if we use extended rotations, we have to think about managing for resilience and landscape diversity and other things very, very carefully to maybe limit those risks, risks into the future. Okay, so I, I'm just trying to be objective here at, by pointing out that there are some potential downsides to this approach as well. Okay, so so far we've gone through the three legs of the disturbance-based forestry stool. We've gone through each one of them now. And, and with the remainder of my talk, I'd like to, to uh, put those together into maybe some other conceptual models that would be useful here. So for example, what if we want to think about both the frequency of, of disturbances, so the return interval, rotation periods, things like that, as well as the spatial area or the size of disturbances? What if we want to combine those two aspects of natural disturbances? Um, well, maybe we could do it here on this diagram. And so here you're seeing those two things on, on a log scale. So these are increasing exponentially on the two axes. And this comes from some research in North, Eastern North America where we, we reviewed all the, the evidence that we have on disturbances going back to about the year 1620 when the pilgrims first arrived in, in New England. And looking at that historic record, we saw these two major types of disturbances. The really, really low frequency disturbances like hurricanes that, oh, so very low frequency that affect very, very large areas, huge areas, hundreds of hectares in size maybe. And then the more frequent gap scale disturbances like chronic wind throw, chronic gap forming wind disturbances. And in this example, a line was drawn connecting those two, and this was called the comparability index. And it gives us a way of measuring silviculture against these natural disturbance regimes. How well does silviculture match up against natural scales and frequencies? That's the idea here. So if we do that, we see that clear cutting, kind of even age silviculture, is sort of over here. It, it matches the scale of natural disturbances pretty well, but when we practice it on short rotations, it's out of sync with the natural frequencies that that, that, that kind of intensity would occur on. Whereas group selection, gap-based silviculture, matches up pretty well with natural scales and frequencies. So that's interesting. Group selection matches natural scales and frequencies. Furthermore, okay, let's see where I am. Yeah, okay, so this was the understanding as of the sort of early 2000s, 2002 when this paper was published. But they missed something. They missed something at that time. They were really just looking at these big disturbances or the small disturbances. And they kind of missed something in between, which we've now come to appreciate and which your lab has been working on extensively namely intermediate intensity disturbances, partial disturbances, partial wind throw events, partial mortality fires, ice storms, localized insect outbreaks, the kinds of disturbances that we're seeing more and more and that we are learning are very important in nature but that we missed in the natural disturbance ecology up until about the, the 2000s. So the more we look for this, the more we find it. We find evidence of microbursts, of partial disturbances going back centuries. This is one of my sites in the Adirondack State Park of, of New York. Uh, 
but I've also seen it at the Uholka old growth forest in Ukraine. Um, people have told me that they don't believe that intermediate intensity wind throw happens there, but uh, I've seen it with my own eyes, so I know that it does. There, there you have the, the evidence. So these kinds of disturbances create extreme spatial heterogeneity in our forests. Here's an example of um, hemispheric photography moving through this area. So just moving on a transect through it, and you see the extreme variability in the canopy structure overhead. Highlight patches, low, low light patches, and everything in between. This is evidence from a, a paper we recently published. The, the, let's see, the solid color, uh, no, no, yeah, the, the solid color is a reference or an undisturbed area. The, this color is the, the wind throw area. And what we're seeing is that in these intermediate intensity disturbances, H index is a measure of structural complexity. Um, thank you. <laughs> These disturbances leave behind tremendous structural complexity. And in some cases, that's not statistically different from the starting condition. In other words, after the wind throw event, it's as complex as the pre-wind throw forest. And then also structural complexity recovers very quickly in some of these sites. So this is what we've learned by observing real or actual intermediate intensity disturbances. And so um, recently I and some others revised this model that we showed you, and we've added intermediate intensity disturbances in the middle. We've said, okay, there's this middle ground that we've missed, and maybe we can manage for that as well. So that middle ground, and by the way, we've seen evidence of this in Europe too. I showed you the example of Ukraine, but you know, um, Tom Nagel and others have, have shown this kind of dynamic in Slovenia. Your group is showing it you know, throughout the Carpathians and the Balkans. Um, this kind of dynamic matches up very, very nicely with multi-cohort silviculture or multi-aged forestry. So not even aged, not uneven aged, but managing for two age classes or three age classes in some kind of continuous rotation. That's what we call multi-cohort silviculture. So an example of this kind of an approach in action is this one right here. Um, tested at the University of Maine, but now applied operationally on a number of different forests in the Northeast. Um, okay, so the expanding gap study. Let me explain this to you for a minute. So this is an example of multi-cohort silviculture Again, emulating intermediate intensity disturbances. And they do it a couple of different ways. They do it, first of all, using a group selection approach. So you're seeing these groups. But at each entry, every time they enter the forest to harvest, these groups are expanded. They're, they're enlarged. So that's the expanded gap approach. And this, as I understand it, is adapted from a, a German system that's been in use for decades, if not centuries. The Germans were the first to do this. They call it the Femmelschlag, expanding gap approach. So it's basically a Femmelschlag or expanding gap, it, and it emulates natural gap, gap dynamics very well. At least in our forests, every time we have a, a windstorm, it, sometimes it creates new gaps, but more often what it does is it enlarges the existing gaps. It expands them, and they move around the forest over time in kind of an amoeba pattern. So the gaps expand. That's a critical aspect of this. <coughs> but the other thing here is the retention of legacy trees inside the groups. Now, why do they do that? They, they do that because they understood that if they just used group selection, and they practiced this on a 100-year rotation. So every 100 years, they would come around the forest and, and the trees would be cut. After 100 years, there would be no large trees left, no real legacy structure. And of course, large trees are a keystone structure, right? Large trees are important for wildlife. And to get a large dead tree, you need a large living tree. And once that tree falls, that creates a big gap and a large down log and then organic matter that goes into the soil. So it all starts with the large tree. It's a keystone structure. 
So to have that, you have to retain some trees inside of these gaps. So they have permanent retention of legacy trees inside these, ranging from about 10 to 20 percent of the basal area, <clears throat> depending on the size of the opening and the regeneration success, which is monitored over time. And then they have a couple different examples of this. So you have expanding gaps with retention, and now you can start calling this other things as well. You could also call this an irregular shelterwood, or you could call it group selection with irregular shelterwood, or group selection with retention. There are all these different silvicultural terms that all mean exactly the same thing. Call it what you want, but what they're doing is trying to emulate that natural dynamic. Okay, so group irregular shelterwood. So irregular shelterwood basically means that we're going to manage for multiple cohorts over time. And we're going to do that, at least initially, through a shelterwood harvest. But the difference is we're not going to come back in 10 years or 15 years with a removal cut to remove that overstory. That would be the, the classic shelterwood method, right? Which eventually re results in an even-aged stand, I'm sorry, an even-aged forest. With the irregular shelterwood method, we leave some portion of those trees at each harvest entry. So over time, we can convert a forest from an even-aged stand to a multi-aged stand. What you're seeing here is just a hypothetical diameter distribution. We have three cohorts or age classes of trees. Um, this might be the cohort that was retained at the first entry, another cohort that was regenerated at that entry, and then maybe a third cohort that was regenerated at a second entry. And then these cohorts are maintained in a constant rotation over time. So this would be an irregular shelterwood method. It's important to understand, though, that this diameter distribution is completely flexible. It's up to the forester, and it can, it can take many different forms, just like natural disturbance dynamics would. Every disturbance event is different in terms of the legacy structure, the regeneration success, all of those things are different. So we can mix it up too. We can try different things in different places. And that's the real science and the, the, and the art of multi-cohort silviculture and the irregular shelterwood method. Many people are really interested in this now in, in North America. And basically coming up with different models that allow the forester to allocate the growing space overhead very efficiently among these size classes or among the canopy layers to optimize growth in each of these. And that's a function of growing space and, and, and sunlight penetration and all of those things. So you do need some, some good mathematical models to do this well. But I think we, we have that now. And then, so now as irregular shelter woods are gaining acceptance, we see these used in lots of places. And people like them. They like them because operationally they're, they're, they're easy, they're straightforward. Um, for the loggers, for the machinery, for the, the, the layout, they're operationally efficient. Um, the foresters like them because they understand how to leave some trees and, and well, quite well in many cases. So foresters like this, landowners like this, um, the loggers like it. So we're seeing this gain, gain a lot of acceptance. I've seen examples of, of this method in Europe, often sort of in the context of close to nature silviculture. So for examples, I've seen irregular shelter wood in oak forests in, in Ukraine. I've seen a couple different examples in, in Hungary. This is an example of um, uh, essentially an irregular shelter wood used as a conversion cut. They're also doing woody debris retention and snag uh, creation or dead tree creation here. This is uh, Peter Oders and Reka Agelos's study in Hungary. This is actually Peter's study here. This is a little different. This is a group selection expanding gap with permanent aggregated retention, little islands of trees that are permanently retained um, in the middle of the groups. So we see lots of different examples. 
uh, under experimentation here in Europe now. I'd be curious to hear what your experience is. Okay, I'm almost out of time, although we started 10 minutes late, so maybe I can cut myself a little slack. Okay, all right, great. So um, with all of this stuff, um, what we're talking about is variability. Variability, heterogeneity, that's the name of the game. Natural disturbances, again, infinite variability, infinite complexity that they create in stand structure and dynamics. Just look at these cross sections of the, the Rockwald forest in Austria, old growth forest, just incredible spatial complexity as you move from one patch to another. You even have avalanche shoots that come through parts of the forest. So, you know, how can we do this as foresters? How can we create this variability? Um, that's, that's the challenge, I think, for, for 21st century forestry, creating variability. Um, and it's important to just not, not, not always try to apply the same approach everywhere, a one-size-fits-all kind of approach to silviculture. So, for example, in some of the, the data that, that I and some colleagues compiled recently for this paper, we reviewed data, published data from something like 500 different old growth forests all over the world. And this figure is, you're seeing different forest types, uh, coniferous, deciduous, evergreen, um, angiosperms, etc. And you're seeing mature forests, which are middle-aged compared to old growth. And we're looking at the distribution of two different structural indicators. Coarse woody debris, or downed logs here, and large tree density here. So looking at these, we see tremendous variability. Look at this range of variability for downed woody debris. Huge range around the mean in the old growth forests. In some cases, these middle-aged or mature natural forests have woody debris volumes that, that overlap with what you would find in the old growth. So huge range of variability just in that one indicator. The same is true of large tree density. Tends to be higher in the old growth forest, but not always. Old growth on lower productivity sites, maybe your large tree density is a lot lower. Whereas maybe a highly productive mature forest can have large tree densities that rival the old growth. So what we learn from studies of nature or natural forests is that there's a huge range of variability around these things. So again, as managers of foresters, we need to be careful about not locking ourselves into one way of doing things. We can manage for that range of variability. I, I, I had some other slides, just one other example of, of a place where we've seen this, just to give you something specific to hold on to. I've tried to quantify this a little bit at this, uh, at this forest here, the, the Verkovinsky National Nature Park along the border between Ukraine and Romania. Uh, I call this the Lost Valley of Old Growth, this, this valley right on the border, very remote, that had never been touched. And um, we, we had an expedition up there a couple of years ago to, to do some sampling in this forest. Um, and I just thought I would share some, some pictures with you. It was kind of a fun trip. We ran into the border guards along the way who stopped us, and I was so glad I had actually kept my passport with me in my, in my backpack, which I don't normally do, but I was glad to have it when we were stopped. We, uh, we rode up in the back of this, this truck, and we all had to stand up in the back holding on to a chain as we bounced up and down the road. That was quite the experience, and trying not to get tossed over the side. These uh, Ukrainian foresters that I, were, I was with, they called this truck mama, or mother, because they said, that's the last thing that you scream as it goes over the cliff. <laughs> Some dark humor. I don't know. It was, I could relate to it. So we rode up in the truck mama, and then we, uh, we prepared, and we went into the forest. But um, the point here is that we conducted this very intensive sample of this forest. We had all of these different stands of different ages, an intensive sample to try to pick up the spatial variability or spatial complexity of that forest. And sure enough, what we found is, is a huge uh, range of tree ages, so a lot of variation in ages, much like some of your data that you're finding. You know, 
different age classes, clearly related to partial disturbances that had occurred in the past. So discontinuous um, age variation, also huge variation among stands in terms of the volumes of down woody debris, especially the more biologically available down woody debris. So again, just evidence of, of natural variability. So if we were to, to mimic, mimic these <coughs> dynamics, we need to manage for variability, not just one thing. And that's basically the, the basis of this <coughs> diagram, and I, I'm almost, almost done with this, uh, with this talk. Um, the basis for this, this model that Jürgen Bauhaus and Klaus Putnam and Christian Messier came up with a few, other, a few years ago, in which they, they envisioned structural complexity or old growth forest structure, if we're using that as a reference, if we're using that as a model to guide silviculture, they viewed that as a continuum, and they called it the degree of old growthness. That's probably very difficult to translate into Czech, but like a, a range of variability in old growth structure, which is what we find. And so that means that for, for man management, for silviculture, we could also think about a continuum of possibilities that would provide some of this structure in different ways. In a very recent paper we published, um, we looked at gap-based silvicultural systems around the world, all the different types of gap-based systems, ranging from group selection to irregular shelter woods to expanding gaps um, that might provide some degree of that old growth structure um, in different ways in different places. Okay, so I've given you a lot of material to think about, um, and I'm going to end right there. Thank you for this portion of the of the talk of the day. And what's on the agenda now? Our group discussion and questions. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, yes. Now it should be a small group discussion of uh, K questions uh, which you have on the papers uh, you got. Okay. So before we go into the into the group discussion and, uh, um, and mm -hmm. before discussion, uh, you of course uh, can give your questions uh, to Professor. Yes, thank you. Right. So are there any questions before we move into the group discussion? Everything's clear. Everything must be crystal clear. Surely there must be a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the perfect talk. You outlined the several elements of disturbance cause management, and you mentioned the disadvantage, uh, some disadvantages, mainly the extending rotation period, that uh, there are some risks of uh, having uh, oversized dimensions or something like this. Are there some uh, other disadvantages or factors that may hamper implementation of such management? Like uh, logistic, uh, logistics pro 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 problems, infrastructure problems with a road network, for example, yeah. or economic aspects or public perception. What, what, what are such mm. possible negatives of, uh, of this approach which one yeah. can uh, encounter? Uh, thank you for that question. That's a very good one. Um, there are probably a number of disadvantages that you would need to consider. Um, and you're right about the, the access or the road network. So about a year ago, I was in Hungary and I visited a, a beach forest that was being managed on extended rotations, but on an individual tree basis, like in Belgium. And there, to access each of these trees, each of these stems, they had had to build a, build a very extensive no road network. And this forest was crisscrossed with, with skidding trails, with logging trails. And ecologically, that has some real disadvantages, especially for, for wildlife and, and some species. So I could see that as a, as a, as a problem. Um, I think just in terms of long-term planning and commitment that you need to make for this, that can be difficult, that can be challenging. So it would depend a lot on the landowner, on the, uh, the status. Is it a, a forest enterprise? Is it a national park? What is the, I'm still learning your different you know, classification systems here, but I could imagine a number of challenges um, and, and maybe those are things that we could talk about today, if you'd be willing to put down some ideas. Just the, the, the question, are, are there some economic, economic studies on the performance of the system? There are. There's a whole literature now on extended rotations. 
I'm not as familiar with the economics, although I just I gave you the one example that I, I do know that there's a, a shift in the mix of products. You know, you might you might move away from maximizing saw timber production, for example, under a shorter rotation, and towards um, production of we would call it veneer grade hardwoods or other uh, or large dimension saw logs that have a higher value, but you have a, to a lower volume of those that would be produced under that approach. So there's a, there's a change in the mix of products. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. No that, questions. Uh, so uh, the, the uh, key questions which you uh, get, you can uh, talk about them in in your each group because um, we think it's uh, very important to interact your uh, your own experiences, uh, your own uh, positions, and uh, to discuss it. Uh, among uh, among you. you, you have a time for it now. And, uh, Can I describe these really quickly? So yes. Yeah, so um, what we'd like to do is have you put yourselves into the three groups. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so we're going to give you about twenty minutes, let's say, to discuss these questions and come up with some some ideas. And then later today, at the end of the afternoon, we're going to have the groups report back. What your, what your ideas are, you're going to share those with everyone, and we're going to try to synthesize those into a set of recommendations. So we're really looking for your ideas at this point. And the, the general flow here is, so is there interest in these ideas here with the people that you work with? What are the objectives that you would use disturbance-based forestry for? Is it just timber, or are there other things like wildlife, carbon, water? recreation that you think this would be useful for. Um, yeah, and then if you were to use disturbance-based forestry, what are some of the opportunities, so the, the, real, the real opportunities to do this, as well as the challenges, the things that would limit your ability to do this. So if you could address those, those points, that would be fantastic. Okay, so good luck. <laughs>